Hold on one second. Hello? Climate change? Oh, I can't solve that right now. No. Go do rugby analysis. We'll get to it after the World Cup. All right. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Sorry about that. What a weekend it was. I think we learned that England and Wales are, what's the word for it? Warming up, put it politely. But I think there's positives for both teams for sure. And they've got games to get things right. And France and Scotland, they're about as warm as can be. They're hot. They're boiling hot. I'm still alive, only I'm very badly burned. They're so hot it hurts. So, without further ado, let's get straight into the games. Wales. Wales played well. I think they've got some uh, pieces to build around. I think... Their maul is sensational, coming off the line out. I think uh, Dan Bigger is obviously their glued in fly half. When he came on, he really controlled the game. Owen Williams feels like Dan Bigger from 10 years ago in terms of just needs more experience to actually be able to control the game. It's the same way that you can at club level. Owen Williams used to play for Leicester, saw him play. Very good game manager. I just think the international level, he needs a bit more experience for him to really kind of get that under his wing. I think the outside centre for Wales, what was his name? Joe something... He's sensational. Uh, and to hear that he's a utility back with that versatility, that's going to be a huge plus. Liam Williams, form of his life, looks great. Wales have some real tools going into this World Cup that if things hit right and the cards fall just the right way, you could find them being spicy in the quarterfinals and semifinals for sure. I don't think there's any doubt in my mind. They've got the pieces there to to play well. And they've, like quite a few teams, they've got a wealth of back row options as well. So... I think Wales have got a lot of positives to take this game, even though they kind of lost it at the end uh, with, uh, obviously, with England having so many people penalised and sent off. You would have thought they would have taken more advantage of that. It's not the end of the world. It's a warm-up game. It's fine. You just want to see the positives, and that's what Wales saw. On to England. And, I mean, where do I begin? First half, it felt like England were dominant in all phases of the game. They were winning opposition lineouts, even though you could argue that was uh, the Wales lineout calls not uh, matching up correctly with what they were throwing. They overthrew them. I must have seen Jamie George pick, pick off two or three lineouts on the back because of that. Scrum time, dominant, more penalties for them than the opposition. Uh, handling errors, yes, they had a few. Wales had more. It felt that throughout the first half, there was no way that Wales could win the game, just even though the score was so tight. They just didn't look like they were competing at a serious level. And it would take for them to have some kind of freak incident of them doing an interception or something to win the game. However, at the end of the first half, England were only up, I think it was 9-0, something like that. And that was with a penalty kick right on the blower as well. And I was just thinking... For England's dominance, even though it was kind of boring rugby, et cetera, et cetera, they had nothing to show for it in terms of points. And and then I I thought that, and I was thinking, why was that? What's going on? And you could see it in the beginning of the second half. I noticed England would have a piece of play where they would have a great turnover in the opposition. They might get a line out or they get a scrum or something like that. And then... Wales would do a really good job with players like Tommy Raffel or Dan Liddy or, some, or somebody in the pack would just get there a bit quicker than the English forwards and cause the ball to either slow down or they'd have a turnover with a penalty. Now, Wales misjudged it a couple of times and that's what caused Tommy Raffel to get sent off very early in the second half because it was a, an accumulation of penalties. But it, I think it was really key in my head that England just, they didn't have the mobility in the forwards that you would need at international level. And the good news, from an England point of view, you proved that was the problem when you made all those substitutions in the second half. Before any substitutions happened in the second half in the pack, I wrote this down specifically, okay? The missing link of England's game is their forward mobility. The, the squad, however, has more mobile players that can come in. Genge can come on for Marla. Genge came on for Marla. Martin can be substituted for uh, Chesham or Laws. That didn't happen. That's fine. Billy Von Apola, change for Earl, Ben Earl at number eight, and put Jack Willis at seven and have someone more mobile at six, whether it's Curry. That did happen. What happened when we saw those just those two changes in the pack? 
The pack were way better at clearing out. People were over the ball much quicker. And that's the big difference. Even though Owen Farrell went off with a red card and we were down, at one point we were down to 12 men, but even though that happened, we were a man down, we still managed to win the game. And that was because the breakdown in the last 22 in the opposition half suddenly just got clearer and the ball was getting out quicker. And I cannot stress how important that was because that was the difference between the team looking completely lost and the team having a very viable attack going forward. And that was the big difference between first half England, second half England. And I hope, and I, I know, I know this is going to happen because Steve Borthwick, he's the man. He is going to realize this. He's going to see this and he's going to make those substitutions. And I think the starting pack needs to be for England. One, Genge. Two, George. Three, Sinclair. Not that mobile. Four, Chesham. Five, Laws. You could change one of those for a Toje, and I wouldn't have a problem with that. And maybe stick one of those guys at six, and I wouldn't have a problem with that. Seven, Willis. Uh, and then six is going to either be Curry or one of those ones that I've just mentioned of Chesham, Laws, or Toje. And eight needs to be Earl. Billy Vonopola is too slow. I'm not sure what he's doing in the team anymore. I have to be completely honest. He's, he's just not a mobile forward that's going to be a cohesive unit in clear outs and everything that you need at this level. It's just not going to happen. I'm sorry. I'm not seeing it. I hope it's seen that way. Earl needs to be the eight to allow that mobility in the rest of the pack so that there is a complete cohesive unit between the eight of them. There's just no two ways about that. Looking at the backs, JVP, I feel for the kid. The kid, that sounds really derogatory or like, you know, they're there, son. I don't mean it like that. I feel bad for JVP. He had a much better first half than he did the whole of the last game. He got the ball out much quicker. He made some good decisions. He made some breaks, made some offloads and decided to actually run with the ball when there was opportunity there. And I hope the injury for him is not too bad. Ben Youngs came on for him, and he was kind of much the same as JVP. He was playing well. Owen Farrell at 10, I think he was perfect for the first 20 minutes. His decision-making was great. His kicking was great. His passing was great. Something happened after that first 20 minutes where there, were, there was that thing where he just, you know, the ball was made of butter all of a sudden, and he just dropped it after, like, doing a double dummy. He no longer had as much to command over the attackers. As you, as you would have seen before that. And then obviously there was the red card that happened. I don't want to get into the red card, yellow card debate. I think by the letter of the law, probably is a red card. But this red card for Farrell, I think, I don't know about it being a blessing in disguise, but I think this might open the door for George Ford coming in at 10, who I think should be the England 10. I thought this before this game. He just has more of a attacking prowess on the front foot than Owen Farrell does. He has better attacking instinct, instincts. Something happened at that age 27 for me where he went from guy from great potential to guy realizing his potential. I think with Leicester, the last year he was there, sensational. Sale, he was sensational last year. And I think he has to be the 10. He's the best English 10 in the Premiership at the end of it. I think... Farrell is very, very good. And I think there was maybe a question of maybe putting Farrell at 12 and Ford at 10. And I think that works a lot better than Smith at 10 and Farrell at 12 because Ford and Farrell have a lot more of synergies in terms of how they play. So they're interchangeable in 10 and 12, whereas Smith and Farrell are two very different players. And that's why it doesn't work as well, in my opinion. However, my preference would be to have Ford at 10 and Tuolangi at 12. I'm sorry, Oli Lawrence, I wouldn't pick you, mainly because of what I've seen today. I've seen you being outpaced on a hooker on the run back. It's unacceptable from the 12 position. I think, I think it has to be Manny Tuolangi at 12. It has to be Joe Marchant at 13 and Ford at 10. I think at nine, it's got to be Youngs. I think JVP is injured, and I think Youngs has probably earned that spot. And the wings... Harry Arndell had a great first half. He had a bit of a nutcase move at the end. Not at the end, when he had his yellow card. I want to speak about, about the Genji yellow card as well. I don't know if that was talking back to the ref, but 
you know, I'd like some more information on that. That made zero sense to me. You know, all of a sudden he's penalized at the scrum and then I'll see you later for 10 minutes. And then that sparked England being under pressure for Freddie Stewart making that ridiculous challenge over in the corner where he got very fairly yellow carded and very fairly penalty try because of that action. But yeah, I mean, call me huffing on copium, but... It's still good, it's still good. It's good. I know. Honestly, this England team can win. It can win with what we've seen today. Create a mobile pack, have Ford at 10, change your inside center, and you just make, might make something of this World Cup. Okay, so film the analysis straight after the game yesterday. Let's go through some highlights of the game as well. Just to talk about some various points throughout the game. Um, of course, it gives me some contents for the shorts as well, which brings more people to the channel. So without further ado, let's go. Stay in front of the Sees a bit of space. Cross comes Liam Williams. Yeah, this was super dumb. Mark. And that's a penalty. Henry Arundel. That was uh, a, a yellow card. card. And just to talk a little bit here, Harry Ondel, I think, had a really good game up until that 30-minute mark. He was really energetic. I, was, I felt bad because I felt he, like he got injured in the first four minutes going for a high ball. But up until that moment, he had a really good kind of first proper start. I think maybe he started once before. I don't know. But he's obviously trying to work his way into the team. For me, he should be on the wing. And there's no questions about it. I think he's uh, he's got so much talent that you've got to give him a go. But this is, I think, is just an inexperienced move from an inex inexperienced player going up to the next level and just, you know, uh, head's gone a little bit. So that's why that we'll happens. Calls the mark, he's got to go back there. 10 yards and he just decides to tackle him, which is obviously, you know, that's the yellow card. Fair Over enough. There for Freddie Stewart. Well's hands okay, getting on he's the got a penalty there. A warning now, perhaps even more. Wow, look at the highlights. We've got the second highlight 40 minutes in. Says a lot about the game. I think Tommy Raphael is a little bit unlucky here. I think the thing that really kind of solves it here, if we just go back, the thing that the reason he gets the card, one, it's a build-up of, uh, build of penalties. Uh, it, you wouldn't get a yellow card in order for this offence, but they kept getting penalised for this. But if you watch here, Tommy Raphael's hands hit the floor there, and I think that's when the ref goes, you're no longer supporting yourself with your feet. That is with your hands. Uh, it's right on it's right on the borderline, but he, I think it is on the offensive side of things, and he's unlucky that he's just the guy that is the straw that breaks the camel's back. And this is an example as well as what I was talking about in the analysis with the more mobile forwards getting there in time. This kind of thing happened less and less once the more mobile forwards were on, and that made a huge difference in the attack. Because if you look where we are on the pitch as well, we're in, within the 22. And yeah, that's what it is. Certainly England losing all... Okay, so on this one, I can't see what's going on on the other side. So maybe the ref's seeing something that I'm not seeing. But if you look on this side of the scrum, the loose head for, uh, the loose head for England is fully extended, which suggests that he's driving forward. And the tight head is kind of crumpled in, which suggests that he can't hold the push going forward and he's decided to push it downwards. If I'm looking at it purely from this side of the scrum, I would say that it's a penalty to England. Both of them have binds. I would say the tight head spines on the arm as well. That's another penalizable offense. But I can't see what's going on on the other side of the scrum where the referee's on. So maybe he's seeing something different. A pace now with Aaron Hill coming off. See that here? See this bind here? He's on the arm. That's illegal. He's not allowed to bind on the arm. Because when you, when you bind on the arm, you can have an advantage of being able to turn in the opposition's shoulder into the scrum, and that can cause some imbalance. You have to bind on the shirt. You cannot bind on the arm. And that's where he's got it. So... They try sometimes to really kind of go on the edge where you can see with the loose heads bind here where he's binding on just underneath the armpit, which is quite a strong position. You get underneath like that and you can push forward. Um, but that's an illegal bind there. Again, I can't see what's happening on the other side of the scrum, so I don't want to criticize too much on the referee's decision. So this is where there's a yellow card. I don't understand that yellow card over to, uh, at all. He said, what's he saying? Over-leaning? Over-leaning? I, like, I don't... I don't understand where that yellow card came from. This yellow card, I understand where it comes from. That's just Freddie judges it wrong, and he knows he can't give the try away. But he ends up giving the try away, and then also getting himself sent off the pitch. So that's a double whammy on just losing your head. That was, uh, wow. I mean, what a bad decision. But I think that really, that England ended up in this position for a yellow card for Genge that really just doesn't make any sense to me. And that's how they ended up back in that position. 
It's concerning Stewart has done that. Don't get me wrong. It's not good. That shouldn't happen. However, you can understand a little bit why they're a little bit under pressure by that situation. That's a nice kick. That's a good kick. That goes Williams. Williams will look to counter it's a nice take. Important tackle, well taken by Shunter. That was a great offload great to offload. Basham. Basham with the dummy. And we get to this. Mm, yeah, no, that's in the face, isn't it? Fair enough. I was about to go on a rant here about a tackle to the chest is not illegal, but I mean, as clear cut as you want it to be. The shoulder is literally on his chin. I don't think you've got any... I, I want to counter out what I said in the analysis part. That's... That's just plain illegal, and it should be a red card. It's fair enough. I've got no bones about that at all. I guess on the positive side, hopefully this means that Ford might start, which I think he, he should have been the 10 from the beginning for England. So, well, it's that. And it's Even Twickenham power. didn't like it. And the thing is, he, he's done that so many times now that I wouldn't be surprised if it's more than a six-game, so six-week ban. So, has not been functioning at all, Okay, so... First of all, let's just go back a second. This should not happen. You've got plenty of men on the inside. You've got a 12 here, and the four is able to take the fly half. So 12 should be able to line up for your uh, center here that's coming at him. So from that, he, like Ollie Lawrence, has a perfect lineup opportunity to come for the outside center here. As, an out as a center, there is no way you should be outpaced on your outside like this. I can't, I think it's inexcusable. Bigger. He's you got another man on the outside of you that's going to be able to take the winger. There's no way you should get outpaced here. You should not be in a bad position and you should not be outpaced. Not been functioning at all, Martin. You've Three got two men Williams. outside of you. Thomas Williams are Inexcusable from my point of view. Thomas Williams, and he did and that happened at another point where he got outpaced by a hooker past the, the line as well. Come it's back. just not good enough. Look at this. He's here. He should be lined up here. He's got two men on his outside. Although uh, that's a mistake. That's where it is. It's a mistake in decision making. He what he goes for the fly half when he should have kept on tracking for the thirteen. It's still a bad mistake, and it's not a good look to get outpaced like that either. He should have had faith that Atoje was going to be able to get over there and make the tackle. It's not a good, not very good defensively. Great scrum here, even scrum. You can see the loose head on the Welsh side is buckling already. The only mistake Liam Williams has made all day. Drives There's round, a, goes a through penalty. Of England, so a penalty would take them ben Earl had a fantastic yeah, game. So much energy. He should be put starting eight. I think he's just quicker than Villapola. So yeah, I mean, you don't get this from the highlights, but... I think from watching the game, England have got a formula for how they can do well in the World Cup. You've got to pick a really mobile pack. No more Marlers. Well, not starting. You can't start Marler. You can't start... Um, you can't start Billy Vanapola. You need to start Jack Willis. Uh, you need to... You can probably start George Martin, but you've probably got to have... Uh, if you're going to have George Martin in there, everyone else has to counteract by being quick because he's a grafter i can understand why he's in there he's good at lineouts etc good scrummager i would just say that yeah why not go for a, a prototype where you have three front rowers and five back rowers in your pack why not why not be mobile why not play through the forwards you know you're not gonna at this stage you're not gonna change the game significantly enough to be a ultra attacking kind of team like france or scotland where you win with possession like that you know, you got you kind of got to go with being South Africa light, but with well, light meaning two ways: light being not as good as South Africa is in like Coca Cola light, and also light in terms of heavy, and just have these guys, mo these mobile guys, just running around the pitch like crazy. Anyway, <laughs> France, Scotland. <clears throat> well. Wowie. First 10 minutes, Scotland come out the gates like a cat on fire that also knows how to play rugby. <laughs> My word. They were looking magnificent. Finn Russell had his magical boots on. He was pure wizardry, Gandalf, Dumbledore, hybrid mix up the wazoo. You're a wizard, Harry. I'm a what? My god, that was exciting to watch. 
France came back, dominated pretty much from after the first 10 minutes up until about the 55 minute mark, something along those lines. The game slowed down. Scotland managed to come back into it, managed to have some key decisions go for them. And then their tries that they'd used to come back into the game were just sublime. These are two great teams. I mean, it's a shame they're both in the death side of the World Cup, much like many other teams are, such as the All Blacks, Ireland, South Africa. Um, I'm sure I'm missing one team in there, maybe. What I will say is that Scotland really are, I mean, they can compete in a big way. Finn Russell is just sensational. Kinghorn, sensational. Their play, they know when to hit the juice. They know when to kick. There's not much to, there's not too much difference in these two sides and they both played a lot of their starters in their team as well. I mean, you got to be excited if you're Scotland. You can do it. You can do it. Absolutely. A few notes to make from this. I got to say France's chemistry in terms of an overall team is just unbelievable. These guys look like they're a club team that have played 13 games together with a solid 15 playing every week. I don't know how they've managed to build this chemistry with having like, what is it, four, five months off, three months off? I don't know, but a lot of months off. Compare this with like the super rugby sides that went straight into their rugby championship from their domestic league over in the South Africa, of course, and obviously Argentina have a lot of players in the Northern Hemisphere. The chemistry in this France team is just insane. And what I mean by this is just you're seeing this with DuPont playing like behind passes, you know, and people just being switched on enough to catch it. Going for quick ball straight off of lineouts, especially lineouts that are like close to the opposition. Like you've kicked in the opposition or someone's been tackled out. And I saw DuPont, he went for a quick lineout and they almost got a try off that. It's insane, you know, to have that level of fitness and confidence in your fitness and both your chemistry to know that you're going to have a good opportunity to score. It's just insane, man. Like it's crazy. I, I don't know what they're doing. I mean, maybe they are training more than other teams. Maybe they have all come together in a pact and been like, we're going to train a little bit more. We're going to train a little bit harder. We don't care. We want to win. So we're going to be in a camp for a little bit longer. I don't know. Not in the research behind that. They may probably would, wouldn't have kept that public because maybe it's against like a collective bargaining agreement or something. I don't know how these things work, but they just look like they've just been mind melded. Like they know how to play with each other. So they just look sensational. The two tries after the second half kicked off by France, I think were just incredible. The first one was from a kick, a good kick by Scotland into touch. But then Ramos... Or was it DuPont? I can't remember who it was, but I think it was DuPont to Ramos and then Ramos back to DuPont on the way back. I think DuPont passed, passed to Ramos. He realized to go quick because the chase from Scotland was slightly lazy on the, on the chase and the kick because they just saw it going out into touch. And then they went quick. They saw that everything was just higgledy jiggledy, whatever you want to say. And they managed to just counter attack and have a great try off the back of it. It was just sensational. Correction. That was the second try in the second half. The first try in the second half was Pinard. And this, again, this is where I made the note about the chemistry. This is all built off of a handling error by Scotland in their own... In their own. It was a real, like, juxtaposition. You've got Scotland making a handling error in their own area. And then Fran France then play off of that. And you've got Dupont doing a back behind-the-back pass to a forward that then sets up space later on, on the outside. Chemistry is just insane. Just crazy, man. What else we got here? Van der Meer. Dan Van der Meer, again, is a very powerful runner. I think he's world-class. He's probably in a world 15 in terms of wingers. He's sensational. The 11, I think, with the scrum cap for France. Good to see him back. I know he, I think he's had some injuries. Uh, he's, a, he's a sevens player, and he's just a beautiful runner of the ball, so it's great to see someone come in there. Especially that solo play he made for the almost try Arguments could be made. He probably should have popped it off and it would have been a try. But as an individual effort, just sensational. And he's going to be a great player to watch during the World Cup. So I, w I think a funny thing to mention here, and it might show up, show up in the highlights when I show them later, but all of the French guys that got taken off the pitch, when they won the game, all looked so disappointed in the performance. Like such an insanely crazy game with lots of interesting things that happened and engaging rugby i wouldn't say either team played badly by any stretch of the imagination 
And these French guys are just on the bench and they all just kind of look like this, like. No. Not happy. Mm -mm. And you know, for players to think that and look that way when you've played like that, you guys, some, we've got to watch out. We've got a badass over here. A few of them, a lot of them, the whole team. Okay, so one thing that I would say that I think is probably a weakness in both teams is I think the game went back and forth, right? Scotland started off very hot, very heavy, got a try. France then got all the possession that they had and they scored a lot of points. Scotland got some possession, they came back. Both of these teams... Their success, I think, is determined, determined on the percentage of possession that they have. And I don't think that's... I don't think that's wrong to say. What do I mean by that? You give the ball to either of these sides for long enough, they're going to score points. But if you keep the ball away from them, you play keep away, you like to play possession rugby, you're comfortable taking small, gain yard line, small gains in, in the gain line, maybe going from your own outside your 22 you're happily making yardage and you just keep the ball and you hardly kick it you can starve these teams of possession and their defenses i mean france's defense since sean edwards has turned up as just you know it's revolutionized their team because not only have they got the flair that they had beforehand they've now got the grit in defense as well however it only goes so far they need the confidence in attack they need that and i think scotland need it too because that's how they're so powerful so I think there is a, a simple but difficult to execute blueprint for beating both these teams. I want to stress that, that it's simple. It's easier said than done. Absolutely. But if you starve either of these teams of possession, you can win the game. I think that's possible for a world-class side. And I think that's the blueprint for beating both these teams. And, the, you, can, and you could see that in both of their performances because... When Scotland had the possession, they started scoring points and France didn't. When France had the possession, they scored more points. And that, that was what the back and forth in the, in, the, in the game was in terms of like the points racked up on one side and then they racked up on the other side. So a little note to make from that, I think. As I said, Scotland, huge amount to be excited about. And I, not that this is important because it's a warm-up game. So, you know... The end result's not important. What's important is that you've warmed up for the World Cup and both these teams, holy moly, they look warm. But the final decision that put the scrum to France, I'm not sure I 100% agree with it. I think the French guy in the line-out kind of almost holds the Scottish guy when coming down and then he kind of falls over and brings the whole mall down. I'd give that a penalty to Scotland personally. But again, I don't think that's important for this. I think the main important thing is to take the performances from the game, and that's the important issue. Uh, let's have a look at some highlights. So yeah, this first 10 minutes for Scotland was just insane. They were just all over the park. Price has another penalty advantage to play with as Jones just stutters, wanted to try and get it away. That's they great away. decision making by 14 to keep his whip out there when the, the when the play started to break down. Scotland stop him the first time, then Cyril by. This is just power. Half meter or two. Scotland it's penalty. To over, yeah. So you can't win the ball and stand up. I don't know what he's got to complain about there. Let's just have a quick look at this. See how seven is like not supporting well okay the argument here is that he might be supporting his own body weight here with his feet then as things go on he's got one knee on the floor and he still rips the ball off the moment that his knee hits the floor he needs to stop playing the ball otherwise that's a penalty i don't think he's got anything to the, the thing is is that the reason that he's he's giving that penalty away is because he's half a second away from that working he's half a second away from still having a leg on the up, up, upright and being able to rip the ball the conversation is still there is he supporting his body weight or not but you know that's that's subjective to the referee and he probably would call it the the way of him not supporting his body weight but even try and get yeah. a sniff so that's what directly I behind the scrum with Antamat they're going to flood to the left hand side Dupont this move Antamat. is beautiful it's opening up for the fly half this dummy move is beautiful. Try. I remember writing this down. Let's, get going, get Let's have a look at here, right? Nine's here. We've got uh, three backs here. They're kind of staying behind the scrum to try and fool the opposition into they could go either way. That's why you've still got three guys over here. And you've got the guys over here. So it's creating a mismatch in numbers already. All of a sudden, what happens when Dupont... 
This is where you create a dummy runner from the outside center coming inwards, which sucks in. Oh, it's just beautiful. He's, he's sucked in the two defenders here. You still got too many defenders on this uh, on this side. So it's a kind of a double whammy in creating space where the Niners taking the ball. You've got this guy coming with a dummy. And because these guys are taking such a different line, it's never going to be obstruction because they're just so much, so much more deep from each other. Because usually this goes wrong because this dummy runner ends up cutting across the uh, second line coming behind them too tight. And if we, it can be called obstruction, rightly so. But because they're so far away from each other and there's kind of two lines set up here where you've got the outside center, I think it's the outside center, coming in here and he's very flat with DuPont and you've got a second back line on the left-hand side here. You've sucked in where there's already less defenders already, creating space on the outside. And it's, I mean, this guy's just lost in space right here because he's got three guys to defend and uh, Pneumatic just uh, manages to just find the gap in between them. And, and it's just, it's beautiful. And th that, that's the reason why Pneumatic doesn't have to pass it out wide for that final play as well, because that space is created on a double whammy of having two guys behind the scrum and then also creating that dummy move as well. So superb, so beautifully worked. So, so perfect execution. This was, okay. The, this is quite annoying for me looking at the highlights and I'll show you why. We'll take you back to the beginning. What you're not seeing here is that this is off of a really good clearing kick from Scotland where they've, uh, he's kicked it from his own 22. He's kicked it down touch. He's made a great uh, piece of yardage here. And what's superb about this is that Ramos recognizes this right here and he recognizes, okay, the chase really for that kick is non-existent they're all relying on oh king horns kicked it in the side in the side he's kicked out into touch oh finally we can have a breather everyone's bunched up round here no one is in a cohesive line there's no cohesive chase and really this is just a slight disorganization in terms of just you know crossing your t's and dotting your eyes every kick and I'm saying every kick, you need to have a line chase and there needs to be a line chase right until the point where you know they're not going to go quickly and the play is actually dead. Ramos recognizes this. He passes it inside quickly and then he just goes. And that's why the space is created because you didn't have a good enough chase off of a clearance kick. Every kick, always have the chase and have a solid line of a chase. There you go, you see here, quick line out here. Everyone's all scattered all over the place and you've got DuPont and Ramos and they just tear them apart. Look at that. Finds the gap on the left-hand side. Off he goes. He's against the six there. A winger, I think. Oh, it's Ramos. Sorry, it's the 15 and the seven manages to put it in. Superb. Really good heads-up rugby. And I noticed that with France as well, that their fitness and their chemistry is just next level. They're willing to do this and go quick all the time. They don't want a breather. They're going insane. Like, I think they're training like twice as hard as any other team. I feel like they've been in a training camp for like, must have been like three months or something. Because their fitness is insane to be able just to do that and just run the opposition off the park. Quick tap. Recognizes the opposition haven't gone back 10. Clever. Smart. That's, that's the similarity in Scotland and France. They're okay to go quick and just, you know, see the opportunity and go for it. Reminder of that. That kick was sensational. Such a perfectly placed grubber that it bounced up at the right time. Look at this. Such touch on that ball. It just bounces up perfectly for him. Oh. That's just... What's the Dan Marino quote? It's just like, uh, there's no defense against a perfect pass and I can do a perfect pass. That's a perfect example of it. There's no defense against that other than, you know, obviously having a fullback there, but um, they probably were already committed on the play before, but there was, there's no defense against that. That's just execution perfectly. All right, we're Paul's perfectly here for a scrum. Let's have a look at this. Plays 10 as well as 15. Well, uh, I'd like to, because it seems like referees are calling something that I would go the opposite way with, and I'd love to see like why they are why they are usually penalising the guy that's overextended rather than the guy that's gone down. Because I'm looking at this at this scrum here, and from my perspective, 
I'm seeing a guy that's overextended, which suggests that he's been driven downwards and, for, and down. I'm seeing a tight head that's collapsing inwards, which suggests he can't hold a drive onto himself, and so he's pushed it down onto the floor. And I'm also seeing on the other side, the loose head for France is coming in at such an angle that he's like he's like a isosceles triangle. Is that right? Uh, a right angle triangle. He's like a right angle triangle with a 45 degree bend. Like he's just, yeah. I I don't know about this. Maybe it's an early drive. I'm not sure. Straight to ground. The call was straight to ground. Maybe he slipped. I guess. Now this I thought was unfortunate for Scotland. See this? Straight there, he's called it as a scrum, and I don't think that's right. McAnally. Guys, both go up in the air. The uh, I think it's the seven for France. He's got a right to that ball. He's still got a hand on it. As he comes down, he grabs the player with his other arm and the other and his hands on the ball. And this is where things start to get penalised. It should be penalised in my eyes because he does that, and then he instantly falls to the floor. Look, he's grabbed the player and he's fallen to the floor. That's collapsing a wall. You've just formed a mall here, and you've just tackled him down. France got hands on it to disrupt, and it has gone forward. So, I think that's a penalty for me. It's not that important. It's it's a warm-up game. You know, these things happen. It's not that important. Let's all get over it. But I think it's important to note that that was, in my eyes, definitely a penalty. But anyway, let's get into some final thoughts. <laughs> Okay, so final thoughts of the weekend. Two games to really focus in on. I kind of really enjoyed that. It made it so I can have a bit of a deeper analysis on the games. Both Watch both of them full as well. So uh, got some great ideas about what these teams are doing. England-Wales, final thoughts. England, pick your mobile pack. Let's have this prototype five back rowers on and three front rowers on that are also mobile. Uh, let's have George Ford at 10. And I think that's your winning formula. You've got an e easy path through the group stages. Easy in quotation marks. You've still got Argentines to deal with, which I think are a better team than England right now. Wales, on the other hand, you've got some cohesion. You've got some spicy players. You've got some potential. And I think you've got nothing to lose because no one's expecting anything from you from this World Cup due to the issues that you've had coming up to it. So if you're Wales, you're, play you're playing with a hall pass at this point. Uh, you've got... Uh, plenty of people that can play good rugby. You've shown that over the last two games. And I'm, I'm excited to watch Wales South Africa next weekend. I think that's going to be a very interesting game. So, uh, speaking about France and Scotland, both of these teams, highly competitive. I could see Scotland doing really well. I think their group, I think their group's with Ireland and uh, South Africa. And that's going to be a really spicy group that I really can't predict right now. Ireland, obviously, very, very strong. But I think they have some questions in terms of playing a guy at fly half that's hardly played over the last year. South Africa, obviously, have Andre Pollard out and uh, Luke Diego's been left out of the squad. Not that I thought Luke Diego was that good. But that's fine. It's, it's something that's obviously of a bit of a question mark for them. And Scotland, you know, you're playing great rugby. 30-27 against France, but you've not won anything yet. So a mix of all those three teams in the same group is really juicy. If you're France, you're looking like the powerhouse. You look like you've had more training than the rest of the guys. You've looked like you basically took two weeks off after domestic league, and then you basically went and did altitude training for like four months up in the Swiss Alps or something, and nobody knew about it. Uh, and then you took two weeks off before the warm-up games, and now you look like basically Superman. So... Interesting stuff. Man, this is really gearing up for a great World Cup. So many good competitors, uh, and I can't wait to get into it, especially because England have a really easy route. <laughs> Don't say that. They'll probably F it up. But yeah, hope you had a good week. I did. I'll see you next week. <laughs>